namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami week on Wednesday is the full moon and this month of July is called Asala Poya, the full moon of July and this is the full moon on which the Buddha delivered his first Dharma teaching and so it's the full moon day when traditionally we remember that teaching particularly. Very often it's recited and we reflect on its meaning. This first uh, teaching the Buddha gave in the deer park at Benares, which is called Sana these days. The deer park is still there. You can see the ruins and uh, there is a park and there are still deer and you can go to the place where the Buddha delivered this first sermon after his enlightenment and he gave this teaching to the five wanderers who had practiced with him who had stayed with him through his years of practice in the jungle but who'd left him when they felt that he had become soft and uh, had returned to what they considered uh, too much luxury, eating well, bathing, those sorts of things. And uh, the Buddha was alone when he uh, became enlightened, but when he started to teach, he looked to see where these disciples had gone to so that he could uh, offer them the wisdom that he had discovered. So he went to where they were and he gave them this teaching. And this teaching in Pali is the Dharma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. The, the Dharma, the teaching, the Chaka, the wheel, Pavatana setting in motion the wheel of Dharma. And in this teaching, the Buddha gives us the framework for the practice that we need to do to become enlightened. In this teaching, the Buddha outlines the four noble truths. And these truths are noble because when one is able to penetrate to their essence and to realize them, one can become enlightened. One can free oneself of this round of birth and death, which the Buddha said is the, has a, be, a beginningless beginning and goes on and on and on until we understand deeply and truly the nature of existence and where we fit into it. So these four noble truths are the framework for the realization of enlightenment, freedom, nibbana. And the first of these truths is the noble truth of suffering, dukkha in Pali. The second noble truth is the noble truth of the cause of suffering, which the Buddha said is craving, tanha in Pali. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering through the realization of nibbana, enlightenment. And the fourth noble truth is the noble eightfold path, 
which is the way out of suffering. And the Buddha said that the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering, has to be fully understood. The second noble truth, the noble truth of craving, the cause of suffering, has to be abandoned. The third noble truth, the noble truth of enlightenment, has to be realized. And the fourth noble truth, the noble truth of the way out of suffering, the noble eightfold path, has to be developed. So this is the path of practice. And this is the framework within which we operate. This is why we need to do it. What's the cause of our uh, dilemma? Uh, what we can aspire to attain and how we can do it. The noble truth of suffering, the Buddha said, is that life in whatever form, whatever place, whatever time, is inherently unsatisfactory, inherently unfulfilling in the ultimate sense. And he gave a list of things which remind us of why life is unsatisfactory. He said birth is unsatisfactory or dukkha or suffering. Aging is dukkha and death is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are dukkha. Association with the disliked is dukkha. Separation from the liked is dukkha. And not attaining one's wishes is dukkha. These are things which we can all relate to. Things which we've experienced no matter how old we are. Even as a youngster, we can uh, remember having to do things that we didn't like or losing the things that we wanted to keep and not getting what we wanted. And sometimes the strongest memories that we have of those disappointments are the things we did experience when we were young when it really mattered, when we felt we didn't have any uh, power or control, when other people were telling us what to do and making decisions for us. Very often we thought then, when I grow up, no one's going to tell me what to do. When I grow up, I'm going to be rich and famous and beautiful and intelligent and healthy and in charge of my life. And hands up anyone who's managed to do all that. What we discover, of course, is that we get older and we do grow up and things do get better, but not completely, not altogether. And sometimes we experience ups and downs almost simultaneously. So these are things which, no matter what our circumstances in life, no matter what our age or state of health, we can relate to. And even if we get everything we want, then there is still suffering because in the end we have to leave it all behind. We're going to die. This is the first noble truth. Recently I saw a picture in the paper of Rupert Murdoch and it was a picture of Rupert Murdoch with his nice young wife and his little baby. I don't know how old the picture was because it wasn't a recent newspaper but uh, if you look at uh, that picture you might think here's a person who has everything, billions of dollars, a nice young wife and a little baby, cute, 
very sweet and very nice picture if that was all there was to it, if it was frozen in time and that happiness was there forever. But even Rupert Murdoch is one day going to have to leave behind that wife and that child. Nothing special about Rupert Murdoch. We're all in the same boat. So we can reflect on that when we notice that we might think, he's got it all. It's not fair. Even the richest person in the world hasn't got it all, according to this first noble truth. Now the second noble truth, that's also interesting to reflect on in the light of that picture. Because the Buddha says that the second noble truth, the noble truth of the cause of this unsatisfactoriness, is craving, desire. The craving which says, which hopes, which propels us to try to rearrange life to be the way we want it to be. The craving is that we try to go against nature. We try to make things permanent that are impermanent. Try to have control over things which are by their nature out of our control, which don't belong to us but which we assume ownership over, like this body, like this mind, like the things of this world, like the people we care about. Craving trying to get things the way we want them. And of course the suffering of being with things we don't like, losing the things we want to keep and not getting what we want. Now the picture of Rupert Murdoch again. Someone who has everything. The Buddha said that craving is endless that we can never come to the end of craving by fulfilling our desires. It is like drinking salty water, trying to quench our thirst. The more we drink, the thirstier we get. Now there's Rupert Murdoch, got everything. This is his third marriage. Now wouldn't you think that one would be enough, or maybe two, if indulging one's desires brought one satisfaction. Again, Rupert Murdoch is just another person like us. We can look around and find many people in the same boat. Maybe we're in the same boat. First child, no fifth child. Again, how many children do we have to have in order to be satisfied, in order to be fulfilled? And it's not that there's anything wrong with this person or that person, but you see how we think that we're going to be able to find that ultimate happiness and satisfaction. And if it was possible by having what we want, fulfilling our desires, then surely someone who's got this, this, this and this and this wouldn't have to do it all again in order to feel ah, pleased, satisfied, fulfilled. But if we notice ourselves, there's always the next thing that we're hoping for, that we're seeking for, that we're running after. So there is someone, millions, billions of dollars, families and children, and doing it all again. If the thirst was quenched by indulgence, then surely, surely there would be an end to all that. But as the Buddha said, indulgence, fulfilling our craving, just makes us better at craving. It doesn't bring an end to our desires. But it is possible to come to the end of craving. 
You'll only seek to come to the end of craving if, first of all, we understand that indulgence, satisfying our craving, is not going to bring us lasting happiness, only temporary pleasure, temporary satisfaction. And also if we understand that that constant craving and trying to fulfill that craving is actually very stressful. That's the other meaning of dukkha. Stress, stress, stress. If we understand that craving goes along with stress, then we might want to try to reduce the craving that we experience. Try to limit the areas of our craving so that we can find some peace. The Buddha said it's possible, but not by just wishing but by practice based on understanding, based on wisdom. And so the fourth noble truth is the Noble Eightfold Path, the way out of suffering. And the Noble Eightfold Path starts with right view, right understanding. Right understanding about where our suffering lies, and where our happiness lies. If we experience suffering, then we're going to want to try to get out. Even if we haven't experienced any great happiness, the promise is there that it's possible. And so with right view, right understanding, we take up the challenge of the path, right view, right understanding, right thought, right intention, the next aspect, the intention to be uh, loving and kind, to be compassionate, and to practice generosity, renunciation. And then right speech, right action, right livelihood. These are the ways that we express our intentions in a concrete fashion in the way that we act in the world, the way that we engage with others in relationship, the way that we treat other people and other beings, animals as well as human beings. The way that we relate to the material world, to the resources of this world, the way we use what we've got, trying to live harmlessly. And then deliberately cultivating the mind, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. In right effort, we deliberately direct our attention to trying to increase the wholesome states in our mind, loving kindness, generosity, all the virtues, patience, truthfulness, kindness, wisdom, and we try to let go of, reduce the unwholesome qualities like greed, anger, jealousy, desire, all of those things which when we pay attention we notice bring us discomfort. And we use mindfulness, the ability to pay attention to what we're doing and to reflect on the consequences of our behavior. And then we also practice meditation. Through practicing meditation, we strengthen the ability of the mind to refrain from acting in ways which are unwholesome, based on greed, on ill will, 
on wrong understanding and we strengthen those qualities in the mind of goodness, kindness, generosity and through doing that we encourage the mind, we support the mind to become much more clear, much more peaceful, tranquil and to be an oasis of peace for us in this uh, busy life. And as we're able to develop those states of peacefulness and to abide in them, both in the meditation and in our daily life, we have the best opportunity to start to see things as they really are. To see, see them in a way apart from our old assumptions, our old ways of looking at things, our old ways of reacting to things, and to start to look below the surface of things, using the Buddha's teaching as our guide, as our framework. So then we have the possibility to start to reflect on the Four Noble Truths in our own experience. The first noble truth, when suffering arises, where does it arise? doesn't arise out in the world, it arises in our own heart. But how do we notice that? How do we see that clearly enough to really grasp it? Only through cultivating the Noble Eightfold Path, all aspects of the path. Purifying our speech and behavior and the way that we operate in the world so the mind has a modicum of clarity and peacefulness. And then deliberately practicing meditation to bring that peacefulness and clarity to greater depth. So that when suffering arises in our experience, we don't get what we want. What does it feel like? Where does that pain arise? And what has caused that pain to arise? Very often when we don't get what we want, we don't stop to examine that. We don't stop to experience it. We just blame whoever it was or whatever it was that we think caused our problem. So we have to be able to, in that moment, move our attention from the outside to the inside and to see cause and effect as it's pressing on us. Didn't get what I wanted. What does that give rise to? How does it feel? We have to be able to keep coming back to our own experience and then relating that to the teaching to convince ourselves that what the Buddha said was accurate. If that part was accurate, maybe the next part's accurate. The cause of suffering is craving, wanting, not the person who didn't do what I expected them to, not the thing that broke down, but my expectation that it should be the way I want it. But we have to look. We have to ask ourselves. We have to see clearly. And we have to do this over and over again until it really hits home to us. Even when we get what we want, What's that like? Feels good, maybe. How long does that feels good last? 
How long before we wonder, is this going to stay like this? Is this going to change? What have I got to do to keep, to keep it? What have I got to do to maintain it? Whether it's a thing or a relationship or a feeling, how long does it last? And to be able to watch and examine and investigate so that we see that even when we get what we want, because that thing changes, changes out of our control very often, that's unsatisfactory. Unless we observe these things in our own experience, then we are never going to be willing to put in the effort that's necessary to go deeper in the practice. And in this particular sutta, the Buddha gave us an outline of suffering that we can readily relate to. And he also touched on a deeper level for investigation because as well as saying that the first noble truth of suffering is birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, association with the disliked, separation from the liked and not attaining one's wishes, the Buddha said that the five grasped at groups are dukkha. Now that part is not so easy to understand. And the Buddha didn't elaborate on that in this particular teaching. Remember that he was giving this teaching to his five disciples who had been with him and left him. And this first teaching was a way of making clear to them that he had found the path to enlightenment. He was uh, showing them what he'd learned and one of those five disciples was able to understand to a certain level the fact that everything that arises has the nature to pass away and he became a stream winner. He became, uh, entered the path, saw Nibbana for himself for the first time. But none of the disciples became enlightened on hearing this teaching but their minds were made ready, if you like, for the next teaching which the Buddha gave a few days later. And the next teaching which the Buddha gave was the sutta which is called the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the teaching on the characteristics of non-self. And this is the teaching which elaborates on the five grasped at groups are dukkha. Unless we have practiced to a certain extent to be able to make the mind clear and strong, calm, to be able to penetrate to a deeper level of our experience, these five grasped at, five grasped at groups seems very strange. It seems outside of our experience because it's starting to look below the surface, beyond the superficial appearance of who I am. And this teaching the Buddha gave to explain that in this world there is nothing of that has the nature to be a self or anything that belongs to a self. Self meaning something that exists unchanging over time. Something that is unaffected by other influences and conditions. That remains constant and that is the core of who we are, 
or of anything in this world. The Buddha was specifically talking about the assumption we have about this mind and body as being who we are, as being me, as being myself. And in this teaching which he gave to his disciples, he explained what these five grasped at groups are, which bring dukkha. And he asked them to examine in their own experience if they could find anything in those five groups that was unchanging, that wasn't arising and passing away, that wasn't subject to causes and conditions that would influence any of these aspects of who we are. And so the first of these groups is the body. And the Buddha said, this body, is this body under our control? Does this body do what we want it to? Can I make this body how I like it, how I want it. And he asks these five uh, disciples that question and they said, no, this body isn't under our control. We can't make it the way we want it. We can't change it to be the way we like. And so the Buddha said, well, if that's the case, then is it reasonable to think that this body is self? If it was self, then one should be able to control it. One should be able to do with it what one likes. But because it is out of our control, then this body cannot be self. In fact, it's an affliction because we don't have control over this body. We'd like to, we want to, that's part of our craving, the way manifest, craving manifests, but we don't actually have that control. So this is one of the reasons why this body is not only dukkha, but it cannot be a self. And then uh, the Buddha said, what about perception? The Buddha moved from the body to the mind. We take ourselves to be body and mind. So if we're not the body, then often we'll say, well, no, I'm not the body. The body changes, but I'm my mind. I'm what I think. I'm what I experience. Who else could it be? It's me doing it. So the Buddha said, okay, have a look. How much control do we have over our mind? How much control do we have over perception, over memory? over the way that we identify what we experience in the world, what we see and what we hear, what we smell and what we taste and what we touch. How much control do we have over that? How much are we in charge of it? Can we make perception arise just when we want it to? Or does it arise whenever there's a contact? And if we start to pay attention to our experience, we'll see that the mind is operating on automatic. There's no me in there deciding, I'm not going to perceive that, I'm not going to remember that. This perception is completely accurate because I'm perceiving it, I'm identifying it. We start to notice only through practice that whenever we perceive something, we are always perceiving it in terms of previous experience and past knowledge, never freshly. And it's not a choice that old conditioning, what we've got in the computer comes up, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, whether it suits us or not. The memories that come up into the mind, we don't ask them to come. Very often they come up and disturb us. 
we can't get rid of them. How often do they pop up and then we realize this isn't good, this isn't uh, something that makes me happy, but it won't go away. Perception is out of our control. And then the feelings that are produced by contacts, memories, mental contacts, or things that we see or hear. The feeling that arises in reaction to that thing, again, is out of our control. It's based on what we know about that from the present, but also from the past, and mainly from the past. We don't see this thing freshly, and we don't react to it freshly. We react to it in, par in terms of our past conditioning. Now, you have to investigate this for yourself to see if it's true. If perception and feeling were me, I would be able to choose how I'm going to feel in this moment, how I'm going to react to what I, f I see or hear, how I'm going to react to what I taste and smell and what I touch. But just uh, think of the last time you were walking down the uh, supermarket aisle, pushing your trolley, and someone came and backed into you. How much was there a deliberate reaction on your part, and how much was there just a, an immediate response before you'd even thought what's happened? whether this person has uh, deliberately bam bumped into you or whether it's someone who's tripped over and uh, pushed their trolley as they fell or if it was some little child uh, trying to take over the trolley and push it. Before you've thought of all those things, the immediate reaction is <gasps> and maybe anger if you uh, have that as one of your habit patterns. It's not a choice. It just happens. And so the Buddha said, how can this be self? And not only perception and feeling, but the way that we then respond to what we've encountered. That is also based on our past conditioning, on the way we did it last time in this situation. And we don't choose that reaction. It just comes up. The words are out of our mouth before we have time to think. We've done it before we've thought twice. But you have to investigate this for yourselves to see if it's true. The Buddha said, if it's like that, how can that be self? How can that be me? How can it be mine? And one of the things we notice when we start to practice right effort to try to eliminate what is unwholesome and to build up what is wholesome is that we can actually change those habit patterns that we thought were the essence of who I am. We can change the way we react. We can change the way we speak. We can change the way we perceive things. We may have been brought up, for example, to think that anyone with a physical handica handicap was uh, less than I am. And every time we see someone with a, a physical disability, we uh, have that sort of turning away reaction. And then we might meet someone. We might get to know someone who has a physical disability. And we uh, have the experience for ourselves that uh, this person's just a person like me with a physical disability, that's all. And so when we relate to people with physical disabilities in the future, we see the person, we don't see the disability. We change our perception, we change our reactions. And this is what we can experience, particularly when we undertake this practice, because we're deliberately trying to change our reactions from unwholesome to wholesome. So when we notice this, the ability to change, we can ask ourselves, well, where was me in the first place? Was I in that original unwholesome reaction? Or am I now this wholesome reaction? And we understand we were neither in the unwholesome or in the wholesome. This is just conditions, cause and effect, process arising, passing away. 
but we have to practice to see this. But the beauty of this, when we really grasp non-self, is that we do all have this potential to change, to become the kind of person who can live happily and at peace in the world, happily and at peace with ourselves and with others. So the Buddha said, look into the body, look into the mind and see if there's anything there that is under our control, that is unchanging and which is mine. And he asked the bhikkhus, is what is, is what is not under our control and what is constantly changing, impermanent, is that suffering or is that happiness? And the uh, five disciples said, no, it's suffering because it's unpredictable. It's out of our hands. And what we're all uh, wishing for is that things would be predictable and would be under our control. We would be able to organize things the way we want them to be. But when we really start to look deeply, we see that's not our actual experience. And so the Buddha was pointing in this particular teaching to the fact that both this body and this mind are not a self. They are impermanent, constantly changing, and by their nature, unsatisfactory. And he said, when you experience these facts for yourself, then you will start to become disenchanted with this mind and this body. Instead of being infatuated with it, instead of thinking this is where I'm going to uh, get it all together, this is where I'm going to be able eventually to reorganize life to be the way that I want it to be, we start to see through that and we become disenchanted. As we become disenchanted, then dispassion arises. We lose that uh, attachment, that energy, that drive to keep on trying to rearrange the outer conditions. We turn more into trying to be at peace with things as they really are. And that leads to freedom, the Buddha said. And when he was giving this teaching to his uh, five disciples, they all became fully enlightened at the end of that uh, teaching. So this teaching very much goes together with the first sermon. The first uh, sermon, the Dharma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, gives us the framework that we uh, need to use for our practice, but it only gives us, uh, if you like, the easily understood description of unsatisfactoriness. This next teaching brings it much more to our moment-by-moment -moment experience. It brings us to what we can realize moment-by-moment-by-moment. By moment by moment. And it brings us to the point where we can see the necessity for taking up the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. So this is a very fundamental teaching because it gives us our orientation as Buddhists. It gives us also the goal which we aspire to, which is complete freedom from suffering. And uh, through this teaching the Buddha was able to express the truth that he had discovered for himself, which led to his own enlightenment, in a way that makes it possible for us to follow in his footsteps. So I encourage all of you to uh, take up this practice for the uh, overcoming of all suffering. May the merit of this teaching help us all on our journey and may it help us all to attain Nibbāna.